You can find the information at WNPS.org. The mission of the Washington Native Plant Society is to promote the appreciation and conservation of Washington's native plants and their habitats through study, education, and advocacy. If you're already a member, we thank you for your support. If you'd like to become a member, please consider joining us. Membership in the Washington Native Plant Society supports native plant conservation and education. It also connects you with native plant enthusiasts in your neighborhood and across the state. Please go to our website, learn more about our work and join. And I'm going to do a land acknowledgement from Burcrest, Washington, where I live. I am, I am speaking from the homelands of the Coast Salish people, and I am grateful for their past and continued stewardship of the land, plants, and wildlife. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the panel today, Chris Earle. If you have questions for Chris or any of our speakers as we go through, please place them in the Q&A at the bottom, I think, of your screen. Some of you it may be at the top of your screen. If you have any comments or links you might wish to share, please place them in the chat. Chris will be speaking on native forests in the 21st century, challenges we've created and solutions we can create. Chris has lived in Washington mostly since 1975. He joined WNPS after taking a class with Art Crookleberg in 1987. He has an MS in geology from the University of Arizona and a PhD in forest ecology from the UW. He has spent most of his career studying the biology of conifers and the ecology of threatened and endangered species, especially species associated with forest ecosystems of Western North America. He is curator of the gynosperm database at www.conifers.org and author of various technical and popular works on conifers and forest ecology. His list of publications is quite extensive. Lately, he has been focusing on photography, hiking long trails, and studying the ecology of climate and forest decline in the Pacific Northwest. He lives outside Olympia with his lovely wife, Bonnie, and their border collie, Laika, Laika, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Chris. All right, thank you, Gail. And uh, I'd like to also say thanks to WNPS for inviting me to, uh, to give this presentation. And let's get it going. So today we're gonna to be talking about Washington's future forests. And by way of disclaimer, um, this is a really big topic. I mean, this could be the topic of a year long course. So we're gonna be covering this from a very high level. And, uh, but I wanna give you a picture of what is likely in terms of trends about the structure and the relocation of Washington forest ecosystems and the stresses that they're going to be encountering roughly during the 21st century. Um, Especially, I, I pretty much sunset this presentation about the year 2100. A few principles I'd like to go through. Um, very important concept here. Ecosystems are composed of species, and plant species in particular primarily respond to climate. Because each species responds in a different way, um, ecosystems are expected to change when climate changes. And, uh, and that is something that we're likely to, to see a lot of in Washington ecosystems over the rest of the 21st century. However, dominant trees in forests are keystone species, which means that they create a structure and a microclimate and a hydrologic environment and soils that help to frame the niche that's occupied by most of the other species that are present in that ecosystem. And therefore, when an ecosystem shifts, a lot of species in it tend to track the movements and the, the health of the dominant tree species. For instance, uh, old growth forests in Western Washington 
dominated by Douglas fir are commonly associated with a variety of other species, such as the northern spotted owl, or such as a variety of different fungi are mycorrhizal with them. Uh, a third point is I'm going to be referring again and again to stressors. Stressors are the things which potentially trigger change in ecosystem. And, uh, and the primary forest stressors that we're encountering here in Washington are drought, fire, pests and pathogens, climate change, invasives, and exploitation, which, which simply means almost anything that humans do in the forest. Um, and finally, it's important to note that environmental and ecosystem change is a continuous process. Uh, there, there tends to be a popular conception that, uh, that the forest was, was some sort of unchanging holistic reality here in the Pacific Northwest until uh, Euro-Americans came on the landscape and messed everything up. And, and that is, is simply inaccurate. Ecosystems change at different speeds. And a lot of this has to do with the concept of climate velocity. That is, rapid climate change triggers rapid ecosystem change. Slow climate change involves slow ecosystem change. The, the Douglas fir forest of Western Washington, for instance, has been in place for about 4,000 years. And, uh, and during that time, the climate was relatively stable. And so we developed a relatively stable forest ecosystem. Something very different uh, lies on our horizon. Just briefly, these 10 species are the keystone tree species that are most abundant in Washington. The numbers in parentheses indicate the number of Washington's 39 counties where each of these species are found. Uh, this is actually based on the USDA plants database and it's probably a little bit of an underestimate. I suspect that you can find native Douglas fir in every one of Washington's counties if you look hard enough. But anyway, these are our dominant widespread species. The map on the left here, the green color shows the, uh, the current extent of forest cover in Washington. The purple cover shows areas that have experienced uh, development during the Euro-American period. And most of these should also be shown as, uh, as forested areas during the primeval condition in Washington. Uh, forested land in Washington is almost equally divided between the west and the east sides of the Cascade Crest. Uh, during pre-settlement times, most of the land west of the Cascade Crest was forested. In eastern Washington, there are extensive areas of other cover types, such as shrub steppe and the Columbia Basin, but the total forested acreage is about the same as in western Washington. The primary factor that influences the distribution of forest in Washington is precipitation. Our, our primary ecoregions, our primary forested areas roughly track in their level of productivity, the amount of annual precipitation they get. So for instance, the highest uh, productivity forests are seen on the Western slope of the Cascade Range and in the Olympic Mountains. There are also localized areas of high productivity in the, the Selkirk Mountains and in, in parts of the Blue Mountains. Whereas areas that get less rainfall also have less productive forests. And this is just an illustration of how ecosystem structure and function tends to track climate. And in particular, to track the availability of water for plants. Now we're going to be talking about climate change here for quite a bit. Um, there are a variety of, of stressors that are impacting Washington's forests during the 21st century. The foremost is definitely climate change. And I, I think you'll soon see the reasons for, for that statement. There we go. I made a little trouble with the presentation here. Okay, principles of climate change. Um, most of you should be familiar with this already, but in general, greenhouse gases change the amount of sunlight absorbed by the atmosphere, and this changes the weather. And the climate of the planet, the Earth can be thought of as a huge engine where our atmosphere and to a lesser degree, our oceans function to transport heat from low latitudes near the equator where there's an excess of heat to high latitudes.
And that's shown in this graph here, which illustrates how there's more heat that comes in at low latitudes. Because of the increases of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, more of that heat is absorbed. That's why they're called greenhouse gases, is they tend to absorb light that comes in as visible light, and then they re-radiate it in the form of infrared radiation, which is another word for heat. That heat has to be moved towards the poles, and this mostly happens by evaporating water at low latitudes and then condensing it at high latitudes because the process of changing state in water is capable of transporting a huge amount of heat. This gives you an inkling as to why this problem is so complex. Um, there, are, there are many, many different ways that the climate system transports heat. There we go. Okay, secondly, um, our understanding of possible future climate change is almost entirely based on computer models. Uh, these models are informed by understanding of scientific processes that influence the climate system, and they are informed by data that has been collected. These computer models are pretty good at predicting statistically average changes. Um, the changes that have been observed in climate since the late 20th century, for instance, are pretty similar to what would be predicted by the computer models for that period. Uh, the, uh, the predictions of these models are highly dependent on certain assumptions about human behavior, mostly how rapidly greenhouse gases accumulate. The question of, for instance, whether we are going to do something to rein in our production of greenhouse gases or whether we're going to continue to produce it very rapidly as we have in the past. So the, uh, the latest round of uh, climate change modeling that I used in this analysis is uh, called CMIP-6. And these are examples of different scenarios. Uh, this on, on the, the z-axis of the curve, the y-axis, we see an estimate of the amount of CO2 that would be released per year and we have time on the x-axis, and we range from the red line here, which is uh, a scenario in which very little is done to curb greenhouse gas production, to scenarios under which a great deal is done that, uh, that represent the low envelope here. In developing these analyses, I mostly assumed that we would, we would be following an intermediate curve where we make substantial progress to reduce production of greenhouse gases, but not to the point where it has significant adverse economic effects or effects on, uh, on quality of life, particularly in developing nations. So far, I, I have to tell you, we're mostly tracking the red line, but, uh, but we may hope uh, for the sake of getting a believable future that we do something in, in the near future to rein in greenhouse gas emissions. So talk a little bit about the output of this modeling. What we're seeing here is projected changes in both Western Washington and Eastern Washington between now and the year 2100 in a variety of, of critical variables that influence the temperature and the availability of moisture that, uh, that can support our forest ecosystems. Uh, summer temperature, we're seeing increases of about nine degrees Fahrenheit, that's five degrees Celsius in the summertime, that is a big increase, okay? You've, you've probably heard that changes of one and a half or two degrees Celsius in the average annual temperature are enough to trigger dramatic climate changes. We're going to be seeing big increases in the number of summer days when the temperature rises above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to be seeing reductions in summer rainfall with summer rainfall going down about 15%. Not much of a change in annual precipitation, but big reductions in annual snowfall, uh, dropping over 50% in Western Washington and about 25% in Eastern Washington. This means that the snowpack is gonna be smaller. It will melt out earlier and it will make less of a contribution to allaying the effects of the summer drought. By the way, I should mention, if you look at these changes, 9 degrees Fahrenheit in summer temperature and 18 degrees above 95 degrees, 
The climate model indicates that in the year 2100, Seattle will be experiencing a summer climate comparable to what you see in Bakersfield, California today. Consequently, we're looking at a forecast of drought. Uh, drought affecting forests in both eastern and western Washington, increased atmospheric drought. There will be less rain, there will be less snow, and there will also be warmer temperatures. And these combine to produce a higher vapor pressure deficit in the atmosphere. And this is one of the main things that controls how effective photosynthesis can be in forest trees and consequently how effective they can be at taking in carbon dioxide, turning it into wood and foliage and, uh, and producing net primary productivity in the forest. We're also going to be seeing increased soil drought as a result of less summer rain, less snow and earlier snow melt. And we'll be seeing increased heat stress. And uh, in this connection, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the heat wave that we experienced at the end of June 2021, which was really an unprecedented event in the Pacific Northwest. But first, this is a little analysis of ecological effects in uh, modeling of an old growth Douglas fir forest in Western Washington. These curves indicate changes in primary productivity in both wood production and foliage production within the old growth forest. And on the left side, we see a, a moderate climate change scenario. And on the right side, we see an extreme climate change scenario as the, that assumes we are basically doing nothing to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And what we see is that under all scenarios, there are substantial reductions in foliage productivity and in wood productivity. And in the high emissions scenario, both values drop essentially to zero which is another way of saying that an old growth Douglas fir forest will no longer be a viable ecosystem uh, by the year 2100 in Western Washington. So, whereas if we do manage to restrain uh, our greenhouse gas emissions to about a middle of the road level of, uh, of increase, it should be possible to maintain such an ecosystem, although it will nonetheless experience significant productivity reductions of about 40 to 50%. Um, according to these modeled results. Now a little bit on the 2021 heat wave. Um, many locations in Western Washington experienced temperatures of over 108 degrees Fahrenheit. The hottest temperature was recorded in Forks of all places, 118 degrees Fahrenheit. That same maximum was also reached in Maple Falls, which is in the foothills of the Western North Cascades. There was extensive evidence of foliage death at locations all over Western Oregon and Washington, and multiple conifer species were affected, although most of the reports concerned Douglas fir. Now, one of the things that came out of this is the, the awareness that climate change is capable of causing temperatures that kill foliage outright. This was not something that was seen in the climate change modeling. Modeling is not very good at predicting extreme events. It, it predicts statistical averages. But there were some studies done in, uh, out of OSU at the time. They went out and, and took some measurements of what was going on. And uh, these, these are not those data. But uh, these are more rigorous data that show how at temperatures above about 40 degrees Celsius, photosynthesis starts to drop rapidly in, in this case, both in ponderosa pine and in Douglas fir foliage. At about the same temperature, metabolic rates start to increase rapidly, which means that the cell is losing its ability to make food at the same time it's burning more food. These, these foliage cells are basically starving themselves to death. And this is a very rapid process. Um, foliage death in Douglas fir needles during the June heat wave was observed to occur in as little as one hour in, uh, in foliage that was experiencing temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius. And this is not something that's limited to our Western Oregon and Washington forests. So over here on the right side of the screen, we have graphs that show temperature tolerance of different, uh, different groups of plants. And they vary widely in terms of their ability to tolerate cold, but they vary much less in terms of their ability to tolerate extreme heat. And in fact, nearly all plants are killed by temperatures in the neighborhood of 60 degrees Celsius. 
And this is very disquieting because if we're experiencing 50 degree temperatures uh, in 2020, it is very likely that we will be experiencing 60 degree temperatures during infrequent severe heat waves by the time we get to the year 2100. And this raises a possibility which had, had not previously been foreseen that we could have wholesale death of trees simply in response to high temperatures independent of effects that might be related to drought, pests, pathogens, or other stressors. So summary of the heat wave results, um, heat waves comparable to the 21, 2021 event are likely under all climate change scenarios. Um, all of our forests are vulnerable. We know that ponderosa pine and Douglas fir are vulnerable because it's been established experimentally, but it, it's likely that, that all of our other conifers are, are also highly vulnerable to this sort of thing. I have not found evidence of uh, widespread death of this kind happening in our broadleaf trees, such as big leaf maple and red alder. To a large degree, they are associated with riparian areas or other areas that have ample soil moisture and therefore able to cool themselves evaporatively. But that might just be wishful thinking. A variety of risk factors contribute to the probability that foliage death will occur during these heat waves. They include what species is being affected, whether that species is already stressed by drought, how long it's expected to, uh, to receive the high temperatures, its uh, slope and aspect considerations relative to the position of the sun, and the degree of development of the leaves that are affected. Nonetheless, at temperatures in excess of 50 degrees Celsius, most of these factors become insignificant and there is a high probability of foliage death. Now I'll talk a little bit about fire. Um, effects are expected to occur that are related to climate change because of the fact that we're projecting hotter and drier conditions generally compared to what we've known historically. There have also been effects that are related to management. And I'm sure you've heard about this. Our long history of forest fire suppression has contributed to uh, very dense forests, which uh, use a lot of water and which carry a lot of fuels on a per area basis. And this has led to great increases in the incidence of fire in Washington that have been observed really just during the 21st century so far. Um, there are also related effects, such as effects on productivity and forest mortality and competition. They're all related to whether uh, fire suppression has occurred on a landscape and the severity of fires that, uh, that may occur in the future. And a variety of forecasts have been prepared. Most of these forecasts take the output of the kind of climate models I've been talking about, and they use them as input to new models of fire extent and behavior. So this is all basically a modeling based exercise. This graph shows the distribution of large fires in Washington since 1973. Areas in white cover the, the 27 year period from 1973 to 2000. There are a few such areas. Areas in pink cover the first decade of the 21st century and they're more extensive. And by far the most extensive are the areas in red, which only here cover the years 2011 to 2018. This hasn't been updated to cover the 2020 fires, which were also pretty extensive. Um, and, and the evidence here is just that we're looking at the fruit of a century of fire suppression. Eastern Washington forests are now stressed by overcrowding, high fuel loading, and drought. And they are responding with fires of unprecedented extent and high severity. Now this is a very complicated group of graphs, but there are just a couple of basic things I wanna show you here. Uh, on the left side, we see graphs showing the areas that are burned in fires. On the right side, areas showing the fire return interval. That is the, the average number of years between which a given patch is burned. The top graphs show results for Western Washington. The bottom two show graphs for Eastern Washington. And what we're seeing in that in Western Washington, there's some increase in the area that will be burned in fires. Um, it's a proportional increase. It's maybe on the neighborhood of 25 or 30 percent. But we are seeing dramatic reductions in the fire return interval from a historic value of about 80 years 
to forecast values of about 40 years or even as low as 30 years, depending on how severe the climate change scenario is being evaluated. So what this means is that a given patch of forest will be burning significantly more often and consequently that the forests will be younger and that means they will also be less productive. Sorry about that. I mean, some technical difficulties here. Okay, for Eastern Washington, we see a somewhat different pattern. Uh, Eastern Washington, the area burned will remain approximately the same as was observed during the historic period. But again, fire return intervals go way down from about 40 to 45 years down to values of between 20, maybe even less than 10 years. So much more frequent fire under a climate change scenario than what we're used to in the past. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about changes in habitat suitability for our keystone tree species. This is, is really the most substantive outcome. Um, this is a graph that shows climate change sensitivity for various dominant tree species. Uh, the farther these bars come down, the more sensitive they are to climate change. Over on the left side, we see here that whitebark pine and alpine larch are our most sensitive species. They're sensitive in somewhat different ways. Um, as shown here, the, uh, the alpine larch is primarily responding to habitat changes that will occur as a result of, of climate change. The white bark pine is responding to habitat changes. It's also responding to non-climatic factors. And that specifically is a reference to the white pine blister rust disease that has been decimating our, our white bark pine populations. Conversely, over here, big leaf maple is the least likely to be affected by climate change, possibly related to its, uh, its persistence in riparian areas, which are going to be less severely stressed by drought. Now we're going to look at three graphs that show the uh, excuse me, changes in habitat suitability for Douglas fir in Washington. Uh, this one shows 2010 areas in red are areas of high habitat suitability. They roughly correspond to the distribution of Douglas fir in the state at this time. Areas of yellow are areas of intermediate habitat suitability and the remaining areas are unsuitable habitat, such as in the high Olympic mountains and the high Northern Cascades where basically things are still too cold and snowy or out in the Columbia basin where it's simply too dry for the species. Now by 2030, the modeled habitat suitability has changed dramatically. Much of the Okanagan, Northeast Washington, large areas in the Blue Mountains and in the Western part of the state have low suitability for Douglas fir, although it still is expected to persist in, in a healthy manner in, uh, in the South Cascades and in montane regions of the North Cascades, as well as in the Olympics. But by 2090, the situation has further degraded and Douglas fir will only be persisting in places like the higher Olympic mountains and the higher elevations of the South Cascades. In most of the state, conditions will be too hot and dry for this species to do well. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about other aspects of humans human use of the forests and how human use of the forests is likely to change over the remainder of the 21st century. Um, historically, the human relationship to the forest has been one of exploitation or neglect. By, by exploitation, I mean using the forest as a source of timber and, uh, and other valuable commodities. And by neglect, I mean simply that we did not perform active management of the forest. We simply let it be, and, and in general, that was all it needed. Exploitation, as I say, is focused on harvest. Neglect has mainly been focused on preserves. Uh, we set aside forest land in wilderness areas or in national parks and expect it to just sit there and be okay. This process is harmful to the forest in a climate change scenario. Here we have caused the climate to change. It is likely to be a dramatic change as we just saw for Douglas fir habitat suitability. And therefore, 
as a corollary, if we want to maintain a healthy forest ecosystem, it's going to be necessary to intervene in these what have formerly been treated as wilderness forests and to actively manage them in order to achieve ecological values. Now, in the future, our primary impacts are going to be coming from climate change, which I've just talked about quite a bit, and also from changes in forest landscape pattern and forest age structure due to various human activities, of which the main ones are land conversion, which simply means taking away forest and turning it into something else like agriculture or development, timber harvest, which modifies the forest structure while maintaining a forest on the landscape, and fire suppression, which I've already talked about a little bit, has the potential to modify forest structure by changing the age structure and the biomass loading and the fuels loading of trees on the landscape. There is also a high likelihood that new and non-native pests and pathogens will be introduced to the forest simply based on the fact that historically this has happened in, in the past and we have no particular reason to think that it won't happen in the future as well. Now, there are going to be a lot more people in Washington later on in the 21st century. You may have heard that population in the United States as a whole is, uh, is projected to be on a declining trend in the future. Population in Washington has historically been driven about 50% by intrinsic growth and 50% by immigration. By the year 2040, it's forecast that over 90% of our population growth in this state will be due to immigration. Perhaps this is in no small part due to climate change. Uh, this is going to be one of the more inviting states in the United States to live in by the year 2100. Excuse me, I'm, I'm having some more technical difficulties with this presentation. When we can talk about this slide. Um, this provides a little more detail on the, the topic of fire suppression that I was discussing earlier. The graph on the top left here shows a record from across the Western United States of frequent fire years, uh, fire years that were recorded at many locations as shown by this, by this arching single line graph. And, uh, and as you can see, we pretty much put a stop to fires in the West in about 1880. And, uh, and since then, they've been very scarce. Now, it's notable that this curve ends in about 2005. So it does not include the dramatic fire increase that we've seen in the last decade or so. But otherwise, it, uh, it clearly shows the, the cut down, the, the reduction in fires that occurred as a result of suppression efforts. The, uh, the paintings on the right side of this slide show at the top, how in the old days, a low to moderate severity fire would typically burn up understory trees, but leave the more mature and stable trees in the overstory, uh, allowing uh, a new cohort to begin to regenerate under the older trees and maintaining a highly diverse forest structure. Under fire suppression, we see, as is shown in the bottom pane here, that there has been considerable growth of those understory cohorts. Now the forest is overstocked. It has very high fuel loadings on a per acre basis. And if it does catch fire, it's likely that it will burn with high severity and extreme loss of biomass and loss of ecological function. So that's essentially the problem with fire suppression history. This is also seen in actual data as shown here. This is out of uh, work done in the Interior Columbia Basin Project early in the 21st century. It shows how historically, circa 1800, we primarily had a low to moderate severity fire regime in the forested areas of Eastern Washington. And by modern times that has primarily changed to a moderate to high severity fire regime. So fires are not only more common, they are also burning with greater severity and greater probability of, of loss of forest on the landscape. So I'm gonna finish up with talking about why this is not a completely hopeless situation. Um, there are a variety of ways that we can, uh, can shape the future forest. Climate change at human scales is essentially irreversible. 
we do not expect to see any reduction in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere for at least several hundred years. And well, we could talk about that later if people want to in the questions section. But essentially, we're, for all practical purposes, we're talking about an irreversible change. But there is a great deal that we can do to adapt to this change and to maintain healthy forests in the face of these dramatic short-term changes in climate. So climate, the most promising climate change adaptation programs that have been put, put forth, including programs that have been put forth in Washington by the Department of Natural Resources and by the US Forest Service, include elements of vision, which is overarching, goals, which define the desired future condition of the forest, a, a condition that changes over time. Uh, the desired condition in 2040 will be different from the condition in 2100, for instance and tactics, which are the tools that are useful for achieving that future condition. Now, with regard to the vision for the forest, uh, we're hoping to manage the forest to optimize ecological surfaces. That seems to be generally agreed upon. Uh, we want to minimize the risk that there will be a catastrophic failure, such as the disappearance of forest on the landscape because there are no trees available to reforest the site with. Um, it's also desirable to create habitat connectivity in the landscape. Because of climate change and other factors, it will be necessary for the species to migrate across the landscape to maintain a suitable habitat for themselves. A lot of the changes that we are talking about are so great that the trees will not be able to migrate and keep up. Uh, trees can move in response to climate change a distance of maybe a few hundred yards per year. Even that would be optimistic. We're talking here about trees that have to move tens of miles over the space of a few decades. And uh, they're only gonna be able to do that if we help them to move. It's also important to designate and defend ecological refugia. Refugia generally are places where there's a lot of topography. Um, climate change moves less dramatically across the landscape in places where the trees and other plants can simply migrate through an elevational range rather than having to travel long distances horizontally over a flat landscape. And, uh, and it's important that we learn to leverage disturbance. When a forest burns up, when a forest blows down, when it's killed by bark beetles, that's the time to go in there and plant the future forest and devise a forest that is going to be well adapted to what we expect the future climate to look like. Appropriate goals along this line include retaining biological diversity. It's important that we save biological diversity for the future. Uh, this includes preserving the full array of species, preserving the full array of genetic diversity that's contained within those species, so not just a few isolated examples of the species and preserving the structural diversity that goes with the forest, which, uh, which is a big part of why these dominant trees are keystone species, is the structural diversity that they provide. It's also important, although I haven't mentioned it much in this talk, to protect special ecosystems, non-forest ecosystems, such as streams, estuaries, riparian systems, uh, talus communities, alpine areas, and so forth. So these have to be an integral part of any climate change adaptation strategy. It's important to maintain habitat for special status species and other species of economic importance like elk and marbled merlets. Um, it will continue to be important that, uh, that the, the forest provides timber for our use, and it'll be important that we control fire. The uh, WUI here refers to the wildland urban interface, the fact that most of Washington's population lives within a couple of kilometers of a forest edge where there is potentially an interaction with forest fire. And management of fire is therefore very important for social reasons as well as for ecological reasons. It's also important um, to preserve hydrologic functions. Many of our forests are essential to watershed function and the, and the provision of a continuous and reliable water supply for our society as well as for the ecosystems that depend on those forests. And finally, there is a, a, a present and continuing demand for recreational use of these forests. And, and in certain cases, in certain parts of the state, there may be other important goals as well. Then important tactics that are used in this process are to some degree scientific. 
We actually have a pretty good handle on science, but it would help to spend a few billion dollars studying the problem more. For instance, we know a lot about how Douglas fir will respond to future climate change, but we know almost nothing about how the vast majority of organisms that are associated with that Douglas fir forest and which have less economic importance, how they will respond. But if we're to preserve biodiversity, we have to study that. Most of the tactical challenges, though, are not scientific. They are concerned with law, policy, and society. They include things like, we need to accept the idea that forests are going to have a different structure in the, for in the future. Uh, they're going to mostly be comprised of trees that we had to go there and plant because there was no local seed source. Um, they will mostly have a much lower density, which increases their tolerance of both fire and drought. Uh, we will have to find ways to assist not just dominant forest trees, but all the organisms in the forest to migrate for distances that exceed their biological ability to migrate a short time frame. And we'll have to designate and manage conservation reserves to act as long-term refugia for preservation of biological diversity and landscape. This can happen for the most part under an existing legal and regulatory framework, but there's very little funding available. You know, I know this is editorial, but if we can spend a trillion dollars a year fighting a war in Iraq, we should be able to spend some money to save our ecosystems from destruction. We don't need to go into this in much detail. This is uh, simply to note that assisted migration, helping species to migrate to new areas is feasible. Uh, on the right side, we have a map of the distribution of Western white pine, as well as of its model distribution. They're almost identical, meaning we have a good idea of where Western white pine will be able to grow under a given future climate scenario. And, uh, and this complicated graph on the left simply shows an example of a decision support tool for determining whether a species needs to have assisted migration, and if so, how it might be achieved. So to wrap it all up, in the future, our forests will be much different from those we have known. The climate will be hotter and drier. The forests will be less dense, primarily composed of smaller trees with higher fire frequencies. There'll be less biomass on the landscape, meaning that not only are we not sequestering carbon with these future forests, we're going to be seeing a net movement of carbon from the forest into the landscape as a result of climate change. We do have a variety of options that we can manage those changes and minimize their harm, but we have limited time to develop this. The, the climate change forecasts that I've shown you indicate that the window of opportunity to adapt to these changes is rapidly closing. And, uh, and in many places that, for instance, have burned in the 21st century, we should already be out there helping new tree species to live in the climate of the 21st century. I have a long list of citations here. These presentations are gonna be posted on the Native Plant Appreciation Month page on the WNPS website, and you can download it and review the, uh, the data sources that I used in preparing this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm gonna, there are two questions and then we're gonna move on to Connie and her wonderful talk. <clears throat> okay, uh, Emily Doyle asked, does the concept of keystone species lose relevance in future? I, I would say no. Um, our dominant tree species are keystone species because they mm -hmm. significantly modify the environment. Um, the trees represent a resource for cavity nesting birds. They have mycorrhizal associations that involve literally hundreds of different fungal species. They alter the microclimate underneath the, uh, the forest and, uh, and create a light and a, a thermal, a moisture environment that is suitable for particular species. So no, they're going to continue to be keystone species even if the, uh, the ecosystems that they belong to look very different. Thank you. Uh, Walter Fertig, in predicting future locations and composition of forests, I think it's important to recognize the time factor involved in creating a new forest. 
i.e. seeds need to move northward or higher in elevation, but also need time to grow to maturity and become a forest. Do you think some of our present day forests are likely to become shrub dominated or angiosperm dominated forests of more resilient or faster growing species in the next 80 years? Well, briefly, yes. Um, <laughs> in particular, um, under thermal stress and drought stress, forest productivity drops hugely. It's, it's quite by the year 2100, Washington is a good place to grow trees for timber uh, because we'll be seeing such lower forest productivity. A corollary of that is that it will take a lot longer for you to grow up, to develop canopy kind of closure, to go through the, the processes of, of forest success. So for instance, it's, it's quite possible that if we go out and reap that areas that were burned in Eastern Washington 2020, for instance, those might not even reach canopy closure by the year 2100. Um, but we can minimize that problem by planting tree species and genotypes that are suited to the climate of the future rather than the climate of the Okay, Chris, you're freezing. I just wanted to let you know that. Okay. Okay. So um, everyone, we're going to move forward now. Uh, Connie Mamel will be speaking on uh, white pine bark <clears throat> disease. And at the end of all three speakers, we'll have a panel discussion where they can ask each other questions and we can come, if more questions appear, I'll be moderating those. So Connie Memel, retired from the U.S. Forest Service in 2019 after a 42-year career. As a forestry student, forestry student, excuse me, she spent summers in the Pine Barns in New Jersey, not far from where I lived, uh, monitoring parasites of gypsy moth, which sparked a lifelong interest in the interactions of forest insects and their hosts. After receiving her undergraduate degree, she moved to the Northwest where she worked as a forester and a Sylvia culturist. She later earned a master's degree in forest entomology from the University of Washington and spent the last 20 years of her career providing forest pest management training and technical assistance to federal land managers and most of the states of Washington. She has been involved in restoration and monitoring of white pine bark, white bark pine, excuse me, and continues this work in her retirement. She is a board member of the Wenatchee Valley Chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society and teaches vegetable gardening for the WSU Master Gardener Program. So Connie, thank you for doing this and I look forward to hearing. Well, thank you very much, Gail. Uh, all right, I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, okay. Um, and all right, so thank you so much for having me um, here today to talk about white bark pine. Um, and I've, I've, white bark pine is a keystone species of high elevation forests. So I think this will um, tie in well with some of the things that uh, Chris has told us. So I've called it a species on the edge. Um, it's on the edge in, in several ways. Um, it's right on the edge of timberline. It grows, um, it's our highest elevation conifer. It, in fact, it's rarely seen because of the habitat it occupies. And it's on the edge of, um, of persistence because of environmental threats. It's been proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act. So I'm gonna cover the ecology of whitebark pine uh, some things about its taxonomy and history, uh, growth and reproduction, and, and the threats that it faces. So white bark pine, it's Pinus albicollis. It was first described by, in 1863 by a German botanist, George Engelmann, after whom the Engelmann spruce is named. It's, it's one of a small group of circumboreal tree species that are called the stone pines. And the stone pines have partially closed cones with wingless seeds. So those seeds have to be dispersed by birds. 
and, uh, and they're dispersed by birds in the genus Nucifraga, which are the nutcrackers. It is the only stone pine in North America. The study of its basic ecology uh, has not been long, just began in the 1980s uh, because the habitat is, is difficult to access and, and it has limited commercial value. So its evolutionary history is, is somewhat poorly known. Let's see, I think I missed a slide there. Okay, so this is a list of, of the, the stone pines of the world. There are four species of stone pines in Europe and Asia, and there are, there are at least six subspecies and some variants, um, but only one is recognized in North America. So all the stone pines um, appear to be closely related and white bark pine appears to have originated about a million years ago and diverged from the Eurasian stone pines. There's a, a hypothesis put forth by Ronald Lanier, who's a professor of forest resources at uh, Utah State University, that a pine similar to today's Siberian stone pine might have crossed from Northeast Asia to Alaska over the Bering Strait land bridge. Now the land bridge disappeared about 2 million years ago. This isolated population could then have differentiated into white bark pine. So the, um, the white bark pines are in the subgenus strobus, the white or soft pines. The pines differentiated um, at least 130 million years ago into two subgenera, strobus and pinus. The subgenus strobus, the thing that distinguishes them is they have one vascular bundle per needle. And, and I have a, an image there of that one vascular bundle. The subgenus pinus has two fibrovascular bundles per needle and those distinguish them. So the white pines are in the subgenus strobus and the section strobus, they have five needles per fascicle. So the five needle pines, the fascicle sheaths are deciduous, they fall off um, and they are all susceptible to white pine blister rust. Examples are white bark pine, western white pine, sugar pine, eastern white pine. Um, the subgenus pinus have persistent fascicle sheaths, so they stay on and they are not susceptible to white pine blister rust. White pine blister rust has changed the ecology of the five needle pines every place where they exist. And this is just an example of a white bark pine needles. You can see that the fascicle has no sheath around it. So the habitats, again, this is our highest elevation conifer. Um, it generally grows at elevations over 6,000 feet up to timberline. It uh, occupies sites that are harsh and cold and characterized by poorly developed soils. And they're most abundant on the warmer aspects, um, on ridge tops with direct exposure to the sun and wind. This is, um, this is the form that they will develop at timberline. So this really becomes kind of a ground cover. It's called the Krumholtz form. This is at Lake Tahoe. And I think this one is up about 9,000 feet. And then, um, then at lower elevations, it extends downward into associations with other conifers. And in Washington, you can find it with lodgepole pine, Engelman spruce, and subalpine fir at its lower extent. So it's, this is a map of the distribution of white bark pine. It's limited to the high mountains in Western North America. And many of the stands are geographically isolated as you can see. In both the US and in Canada, um, most of white bark pine habitat is on public land. In the United States, 98% of the habitat is public land, national forests, national parks, some Bureau of Land Management and some of the Indian reservation lands. And a large proportion of it, about 70%, 
in the US is designated wilderness. It's divided into Western and Eastern ranges with a kind of a tenuous connection of isolated stands in Southeast, Southeast British Columbia and Northeastern Washington. You can see that on the map. The Western range um, includes the coast range of British Columbia, the Cascade range of Washington through central Oregon and as far south as the Southern Sierra Nevadas in California and, uh, and also Western Nevada. The Eastern range um, includes the Rocky Mountains of Alberta and Montana, Idaho and Western Wyoming. So the limitations of it to the north and the west of its range, it's limited, limited by competition. So those wetter conditions will favor other conifers, things like lodgepole pine and subalpine fir to the north um, and mountain hemlock to the west. And to the south and the east, it's probably restricted by drought. At the south end, it's replaced by limber pine, which is more drought tolerant. And to the east, you have the Great Plains. So a little bit about the whitebark pine environment. So in, uh, in the, the summer temperatures, the, let's see, the average July temperatures, excuse me, I think I, did I miss something here? No, I guess I didn't. Okay, winter temperatures. So the average January temperature above the snow is a high of about 23 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of seven degrees with the absolute minimum around minus 29 degrees Fahrenheit. But under the snow, the temperature is usually about 32 degrees. And in the summer, the average July temperature is a high of 64 with a low of 39 and an average maximum of about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So killing temperatures, in midwinter, the killing temperature hasn't been measured. But we know that for Japanese stone pine, it's minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And for Swiss stone pine, it's even colder, minus 112. So the midwinter killing temperatures are, probably are not reached in the field. However, um, the killing temperatures in the summer probably are reached in the field. Um, in the summer, the soil surface, te surface temperature above 140 um, will kill Swiss stone pine seedlings. And it, um, field observations do indicate that whitebark pine seedlings probably succumb to heat on southwest facing slopes in the summer. Now precipitation in, in whitebark pine habitat ranges from 22 inches to 63. Um, and more than 85% of this falls as snow. So it's mostly snow um, and about 15% falls in the summer as 10 to 11 summer showers. Now at, at upper elevation, the, um, the limit is the amount of growing season by the length of the growing season. The tree needs about a hundred days from the onset of spring growth to the hardening of tissues in, in the autumn. And at lower elevation, it's set by competition. So I, um, I took this picture. Uh, so this is a white bark pine on, um, on your, your left uh, with my arm around it. Um, it's growing at 3,500 feet elevation along with Western white pine, lodgepole pine and Douglas fir. So these, these seeds were brought in by nutcrackers after a fire. And a number of them have germinated and they've survived for several years, but they grow slowly and they're not tolerant of shade. So they're gonna be outcompeted by faster growing conifers. Um, in fact, this is a cottonwood campground up the Eniat River, and all of these trees uh, have since burned since this photo was taken. 
So growth and reproduction, the trees are capable of producing seed cones at uh, 20 to 30 years of age, but large cone crops are typically not produced until the tree is 60 to 80 years old. Um, the intervals between large cone crops are generally three to five years. And it's been about five years since the last um, large cone crop in Eastern Washington. So the male cone buds um, develop in April through early June, and then the buds break in mid-June. This is a picture of the male cones. They're small, that's one centimeter by one centimeter, and bright red when they mature. Then the pollen is wind dispersed. It's shed from the pollen cones from May through mid-August. So here are female cones. Um, there are two clusters right together in this photograph. The cluster on the upper left is one-year cones, and the lower cluster is two-year-old cones. They require two years to mature. The, the female cones are receptive to pollen during year one. They open up, they receive the pollen, and then the cones, cone scales close. And, and they stay closed until spring of the second year. Then the egg the eggs occur, the, poll the pollination occurs, and the cones start to enlarge rapidly. They become deep purple, two to three inches long. The seeds mature between mid-August and mid-September, and the, the cones do not open. So this is a picture of a Clark's nutcracker. Clark's nutcrackers cat are essential to white bark reproduction. They cache white bark pine seeds for later recovery. And radio tracking of individual birds has indicated that sometimes they will cache right where they collect the seeds, but they will also fly up to 20 miles from the point of collection and cache seeds. They often cache seeds on windswept south facing slopes where the seeds and the seedlings are easy to recover. Because of course, that's their purpose for caching, is to come back and get seeds later. And really only about 15% of the seeds that they cache are cached where germination is possible. Many of them are cached in tree branches or they're cached in places where they're outside the ecological niche. But enough is cached that, that you do get a lot of reproduction in good areas. So this is, a, this is a picture of typical, typical white bark caching or white bark feeding of Clark's nutcrackers. Now Clark's nutcrackers aren't the only ones who like white bark pine cones. The seeds are large and they're high in protein and they're an important part of the diets of squirrels and also bears. In the Rockies, uh, grizzly bears are known to seek out white bark pine seeds uh, by preference for their high fat and protein content. So this is, a, this is an example of what squirrels will do to white bark, white bark cones. They tear the cone scales off and they eat the seeds. They also cache the cones um, and they'll cache them in below ground middens. So it's really not an environment that's uh, suitable for germination. Black bears eat the whole cone and they pass undigested debris and probably some germination results from this, but it's much less effective than the caching that Clark's nutcrackers do. So fire ecology, uh, fire is important to maintaining white bark pine at its lower elevation range because it's cereal there. But fire ecology is complex. White bark pines are thin barked and they're often killed by fire, even the larger trees. But fire also provides a seed bed where seedlings establish well. And these burned areas are favored by Clark's nutcrackers for caching. The form of mature trees Multi-stem trees are very common. 
And that may be due to the germination of multiple cached seeds, or it could be seeds with multiple embryos. And old white bark pines typically lose their apical dominance. So they grow in the open in this way. Um, they're flat topped with diverse crowns or diffuse crowns, I'm sorry. They're long lived. Um, specimens in central Idaho have been dated at 700 to up to a thousand years. And the largest white bark pine on record is nearly nine feet in diameter. Now decline of white bark pine has been observed since at least the 1980s. And in 2010, the US Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned to put white bark pine on the endangered species list. And four threats to white bark pine have been identified. And one is white pine blister rust, which is an introduced fungal disease. The second is mountain pine beetles, which is a native tree killing bark beetle. The third is changes in the fire regime, which is a combination of fire suppression and catastrophic wildfire. And the fourth is climate change, which exacerbates damage both by fire and bark beetles. So the first threat, white pine blister rust, and uh, Chris mentioned that this was something that was likely to change the viability or threaten the viability of white bark pine. It's caused by an introduced fungus, Cronartium ribicola. It was brought to the US from Asia via Europe in the late 1800s. It was first found in the Western United States about 1910. All of the five needle pines are susceptible and it can kill trees of all ages. And today it's nearly ubiquitous across the range of white bark pine, even in those cold dry areas where it was originally thought to be um, not occurring. Let's see. So um, when blister rust becomes active in the stem of white bark pine, the trees respond by pitching abundantly in this way. And later they develop this thick roughened bark. And, and that, uh, that evidence will persist for decades after the tree dies. So people like me who go out and survey for the presence will, can detect that. Sometimes an infected mature tree will survive, but the cone bearing upper branches are typically killed. So that eliminates the seed source. And this is an example of that. This is a mature white bark pine that's been now girdled by white pine blister rust, and you can see that the upper branches are starting to die. The second threat, mountain pine beetles. It's a native insect. It kills many species of pines. It's really most closely associated with lodgepole pine. White bark pine, however, is a, a perfectly suitable host, but the outbreaks have been infrequent because the high elevation habitat provides a short development season for the beetle. Mountain pine beetles can prefer to go through a one year life cycle. They can complete their life cycle in two years if they have to, but they're not as successful. Now, as, as winters are getting shorter, it improves beetle success in white bark pine habitat. So the third threat, changes in fire regime. Um, the combined effects of fire suppression and then large catastrophic fires have eliminated many of the large white bark pines that, that Clark's nutcrackers would visit and harvest. And then at the lower elevations where white bark pine um, is, is growing, those have undergone succession to more shade tolerant conifers. So it's a complex kind of newest nuanced relationship with fire suppression and catastrophic fire that, that is threatening white bark pines persistence also. 
This is not as colorful a map as Chris was able to show us, um, but this is from a climate model by Warwick in 2007. Um, it's, it has created conditions where, where mountain pine beetle outbreaks and, all, and natural fire regimes have altered. And the predicted rates of climate change could outpace white bark pine's ability to respond to habitat changes and, and ultimately result in habitat loss. This is just a picture of Warwick's model, but all of the current climate models predict a loss of habitat for white bark pine. Canada has also recognized the threats to white bark pine. And in 2012, white bark pine was legally listed by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada as endangered. Now in December of 2020, the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, listed in their annual notification that they proposed to list white bark pine as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And they have accepted comments on this proposed listing and, and many comments were received, but the final, final call has not yet been made. The Pacific Northwest has, uh, has put together a white bark pine restoration strategy. This is for federal lands with eight key actions to reach the goal of achieving a network of viable populations of white bark pine. Um, I was part of this group that put the restoration strategy together and much of this has been, has been implemented. Really the objective is to keep white bark pine off the list. You don't want species going on the list, but, but really the, the threats, most of them still exist. Certainly um, white pine blister rust is still a threat. Climate change is still a threat. Fire is still a threat. The uh, mountain pine beetle outbreak that, that occurred in the 1990s and early 2020s has for now much reduced, but, but that could occur again. So these, these, are, these are the components of the strategy, collecting seed for gene conservation and rust resistance screening, very important. Assessing stand conditions in priority management units and the priority management units have been identified. Develop a plan for planting rust resistant seedlings and that plan has been developed and implemented. Continue rust resistant screening and identifying resistant parent trees that is ongoing and resistance has been identified in the species. Treatment for mountain pine beetle in high risk units, that is still going on where it's appropriate and developing an approach for wilderness planting. This has not happened. Um, and since 70% of, um, of the habitat is in congressionally designated wilderness, this is something that still needs to happen. Mitigating the impacts of climate change that may involve things like um, assisted migration. However, white bark pine is already at timberline and developing a monitoring plan that has been done. So um, these, are, these are some of the things that have been going on, collecting cones from rust resistant parent trees. Now this, this um, climber, is caging the, the cones that will later be collected. And that is essential because Clark's nutcrackers will come and collect the seeds before we do. And they'll collect the seeds before they're fully ripe. So um, not all of these cones are gonna be caged. That would not be advisable or even practical, but, but sampling from all, all of the um, identified parent trees will, will be caged. And then later, the climbers will come back and collect the cones when they're ripe. Testing for genetic resistance. This test is, um, is quite um, impressive. So these seedlings are deliberately um, exposed to the blister rust spores. 
and efforts are made to infect them. So you can see which ones have shown resistance and which ones have not. Planting them, planting the rust resistant stock in the appropriate seed zones. However, no planting has yet been done in wilderness. This is an example of the application of verbenone, which is a mountain pine beetle. Um, it's called an anti-aggregant. What it does is it gives the mountain pine beetle a signal that this tree has already been attacked. And so, um, so this, is not, this is not a good area to try and, um, and it attack the tree again. So the tree that's been been treated here with verbenone. This one is already dead, but, but the verbenone puts out a, think of it as perfume. So it, it uh, affects the area. And then um, releasing white bark pine from competition. So this is a lower elevation, a white bark pine stand, and the subalpine fir has been removed. And here, um, this, this is a, an example of, of a forester doing white bark pine surveys. So there are over 200 permanent transects in Washington and Oregon that are being monitored. The transects are a tenth of an acre, 150 feet long by 30 feet wide. They're remeasured every five years to monitor for insects, disease, cone crops, and reproduction. And this is just a sampling then. So this is, this is just one survey that was remeasured in 2020 after five years. There were five new white bark pine, 30% blister rust infection. Um, there was 4% mortality since the previous measurement, no mountain pine beetle activity, and total of 10 new seedlings and saplings. That's the kind of data that we're, that we're trying to maintain. So, um, so these are some resources if you're interested in finding out more about white bark pine. I'd really encourage you to go to the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation's website. Um, that, that is the organization that is managing, managing a lot of the data and funding quite a lot of the, uh, of the work that's being done with, with white bark pine in association with the Forest Service and the Park Service. So, um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Connie. Right now, there are no questions, but I'm sure we'll get some as we go on. Next, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jacob Benson, who's going to speak on big leaf maple decline in Western Washington. And Jacob grew up on the Western slope of Colorado near Grand Junction and received an undergraduate degree in forestry from Colorado State University. After this, he held several positions in Colorado, working on research projects concerning nutrient cycling, dendrochronology, and forest responses to climate change and fire. After this, he worked with the Be Forewarned Climate Research Project in Minnesota and the Great Basin Institute's Conservation Corps and Native Sea Collection in Southern Nevada. Next, he completed a master's degree at the University of Washington, studying big leaf maple decline, which is the topic of this presentation. After graduating, he worked for the US, UFSF, Forest Inventory and Analysis, FIA in Nevada, in Utah, surveying randomized plots. He currently works for the USFS Forest Health and Protection in Core the De Orleans, Idaho, as a biotech aerial observer, monitoring and advising on forest insect and disease issues in Idaho and Montana. He lives with his wife and one-year-old son in Spokane. So Connie, if you could stop sharing your screen, um, then um, Jacob can come on. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes, I see your picture there. Huh. No, the screen share is done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I'm sharing my presentation now. Can everybody see it? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Jacob. Okay, perfect. 
Yeah, so my talk today will be on big leaf maple decline, which I um, studied during my master's program in the University of Washington and graduated in 2018. Uh, so big leaf maple is um, distributed along the western coast of North America. So it goes all the way up from British Columbia down to Southern California, all along the coast. Um, it's a pretty important species, both for um, ecological services, uh, for natural environments, and then also for, for humans as well, commercial, cultural, and urban tree. Um, it's got a lot of important uses. One of the key ones that people are probably more familiar with is just as a urban tree planted in parks and in people's yards. It's a really good shade tree and it's pretty popular. And it can be pretty expensive to take out of your yard or out of a park or something like that. So that's uh, one of the, the key interests in it. Uh, big leaf maple decline, uh, the topic of my research, it was first noticed in 2010 when concerned citizens began reaching out to the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Uh, symptoms that people were reporting include yellow flagging, large branches, partial or entire crown dieback, reduced leaf size, low to triple leaves, yellow edges, heavy seed crops, and death. Um, just kind of all things um, indicative of a tree that's just not doing that well, that's struggling with some sort of systemic issue. So the Washington DNR began an investigation. In 2014, they were able to sample 63 sites where decline was reported. And they were primarily interested in seeing if there was some sort of uh, pathogen or insect pest or something that might be causing this, this uh, new decline in trees. Uh, so these were convenient sampling along roadsides, single big leaf maple. They took clippings and cores and uh, to see if they could find any sort of uh, pathogen or insect. Uh, so they found the usual things, um, armillaria, Ganoderma, but they didn't find anything substantial in all of the trees. So kind of no smoking gun, just like general background levels of uh, forest pathogens and insects. Uh, so that kind of pointed the direction to either something else. So here you can see a picture of what a healthy big leaf maple looks like on the left and the declining one on the right. So if it's not one of the usual suspects, then it kind of points in a different direction. So they thought it might be a new or introduced pathogen or insect, something that was um, unable to find. A lot of the pathogens, that, um, the way they're able to find pathogens is they do a genetic sequence or something like that. So if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, it might not show up if there's some sort of new bacteria or fungus or thing of that nature that's not super evident when you're looking at the tree. Same thing for an insect that just doesn't show up and uh, you know, it maybe is impacting the trees at a different time of year than when they sampled or something like that. Could be changing climate, of course. Um, as we've heard, the Pacific Northwest is experiencing warmer, drier summers um, and probably a little bit less snowfall as well. So some of the things might be just kind of stressing the trees out. Or a third, it could be some sort of new or increased pollutant um, from an anthropogenic source, like some sort of heavy metal or something like that. So those are kind of just all the possible things that they might be causing it, um, which is why they brought me on and my professor and all the people that I worked with at the University of Washington. Uh, our primary goal for my master's project was to examine the association between um, uh, biotic and abiotic factors in big leaf maple decline, and then also our ultimate goal was to determine the cause of decline and guide potential mitigation effort and management options. So asking a couple of different questions here. Um, so are there any site or landscape variables associated with big leaf maple decline? So is there anything about where the maples were declining that might uh, give us a good hint about what exactly is causing this? Are there any um, chemical elements in the soil or foliar tissues associated with big leaf maple decline? So what we're doing here is we're taking samples to, and running them on a, um, uh, analyzing them to see you know, if there's elevated levels of any kind of like uh, fertilizer, nutrient, heavy metals, anything like that that might um, cause a more like abiotic, anthropogenic pollution um, aspect there. And then also we took tree cores and used dendrochronological methods to estimate the spatial and temporal occurrence of decline. So what we're doing there is to see when these trees started declining, where they were declining throughout time to see if there's any sort of spatial temporal pattern that might indicate like, oh, it's a disease that's spreading north or 
Well, it's something that first showed up in Seattle and then moved up throughout the state, something like that. So study design. Uh, so I should probably back up here for just a second and say that um, big leaf maple decline has been uh, reported throughout its entire range from British Columbia all the way down to California. But the um, my project and the uh, presentation I'll be given today strictly concerns Washington just for funding reasons. We didn't, you know, couldn't have me traveling all over the West Coast. So I stuck to Washington. That's where we did our study. But my guess would be that any anything we're finding here in the study is probably relevant for the for the whole range of big leaf maple. So we took a random subset of the DNR sites, uh, some landowner sites. Those are people that just contacted us and want us to kind of the property single tree roadside sampling. Those are single trees that I sampled um, just uh, along the roadside that I saw that were declining. And then the real, um, the meat of our study was these randomly collected sites on public lands. So what we did there is we just found areas on public lands where we knew big leaf maple was present. I would say like, oh, this whole watershed or this valley or, or this, you know, region or district of the national forest has got a big leaf maple. So we randomly put um, forest plots down there, and then we'd go to those sites. And if they had big leaf maple there, we'd sample them. And if not, then we would just go to the next randomly selected plot. So the goal of this was to get an unbiased sample of the big leaf maple throughout Western Washington, uh, throughout the range of big leaf maple in Washington, uh, to tell us, you know, because it's unbiased, it can tell us is like, oh, you know, there really is a association between big leaf maple and, you know, um, X piece of information or like, you know, elevation slope, temperature, things like that. Uh, so these were 10th acre plots. And then we sampled three big leaf maple and three conifers to get a good comparison um, on each plot. So we could say like, oh, is it, you know, how is the growth of big leaf maple comparing to all the trees on the plot? So we primarily stuck to Douglas fir because that was the most common tree on all of our plots. And then we also took foliar and leaf samples from the plot for our uh, chemical analysis. Um, in addition to that, we plug the plots and we into PRISM, which is a awesome climate data resource that gives you monthly um, uh, weather readings for um, from 1981 all the way to 2006, which is the year before my my field season 2017. So that was the latest that we were able to get. Um, basically, and it just gives us precipitation, vapor pressure deficit, temperature for every month out of the year um, for all the locations where our plots were. And we also looked at the NAT National Land Cover Database to see what type of landscape was present close to the plot. So is it developed? Was it grassland, forest land? Um, primarily, we were looking at this to see how much development was in the area, you know, how many roads and buildings and uh, parking lots and things like that. So this is a spatial extent of big leaf maple decline. So here we can see the solid triangles or the random plots with decline and the um, empty triangles are the ones without decline. So the important thing here is that we're kind of seeing that pretty much throughout the bit range of big leaf maple, this decline was present everywhere. So there's no part of the state where it was really more or less present or where there was no decline whatsoever. And we determined that a tree had declined just based on the symptoms of the tree. If there was uh, any amount of, you know, leaf wilt or discoloration or smaller leaves, just um, any sort of symptoms present with our, our syndrome. Uh, so some key findings there were that decline was widespread throughout the state, not limited to one region. There was localized clusters of decline. So if there was decline in one tree, you're more likely to find it within a quarter mile of it, but there's no widespread uh, spatial clustering. The majority of study sites had some, some presence of decline, and this was uh, consistent with increased tree mortality rates that other people have found in um, other studies. So some of the stuff you've been hearing about today already, just that there's increased tree mortality, um, it's kind of um, makes sense in relation to that. So the percentage of individual big leaf maple trees declining. Uh, the important thing here is you go down to randomized sites. So of all the big leaf maple in Western Washington, based on our study, we determined that about 18% of them were showing some, some level of decline based on our symptoms. Uh, 
uh, relates to tree size. So the DS DSH is just the uh, diameter at standard height, so pretty similar to the diameter of breast height. Um, and we're looking at just the random plots uh, with decline and without decline. So you can see that the tree size, no matter what the size of the tree, there is plenty of trees present that were showing decline. And there wasn't really a clear relationship. So it's not just the younger trees, not just the older, larger trees that are declining. It's pretty much across the board, all, all different tree sizes were showing uh, similar rates of decline. So when we compared the uh, amounts of decline on sites versus their uh, temperature and precipitation, um, basically what all, all four of these graphs are saying is that when the summer temperature um, was higher and when the precipitation was lower for those sites com compared to others, you were more likely to find decline. So this leads us to think that um, basically the warmer, drier summers that uh, the Pacific Northwest has been experiencing lately might or likely are causing a uh, decline in big leaf maple or at least um, associated with it. Uh, same thing for developed landscapes. So the closer these trees were to major roadways uh, and minor roadways, and then the closer they were to uh, developed landscapes. So within a certain, um, I think it was a one kilometer radius if there was more developed land. Uh, for, so for both of those things, you were more likely to find trees that were declining. So what this basically says is that the more development there was around these trees, the more likely they were to decline. And this could be caused by a number of factors, but um, like a heat island effect, you know, the more asphalt and things there are close to these trees, they're probably a little bit more stressed climatically. And then there's also increased disturbance and pollution and things like that. So with more and more development and people moving to the Pacific Northwest, you're probably gonna increase some of these stressors on big leaf maple. So this is the chemical analysis I was talking about. So we looked at carbon and nitrogen and a whole other range of uh, mostly heavy metals, but also some plant nutrients. And then for the soil, we looked at bulk density and soil pH as well. So this plot is a little bit messy, but it's just kind of showing all the different elements and the ones that were significant. And what we saw here is that the pluses and minuses are the ones that were uh, positively or negatively associated with big leaf maple decline. So for example, in the foliar tissues, the more silicon, which is a nutrient, the less decline there was, but the more arsenic in the leaves, the greater the decline was. Um, and then over here for the soil, there's a, quite a bit that are negatively associated. So there might be some sort of nutrient and then chromium down at the bottom is positively associated with decline. So there probably is a little bit um, going on there, but it could either be that these elements are actively uh, affecting the trees and leading towards the decline, or it could just be an association that these trees that live in more urban areas um, both are experiencing other stressors, such as the heat island effect, but then also they just happen to be have more of these pollutants since they're closer to urban areas. So for our study, we didn't really have the time to actually prove that any of these elements might be affecting the trees, but we just wanted to point out that there was an association there that um, might be part of the issue. Uh, so this kind of lays out our dendrochronological analysis. So our goals were to determine the effect of climate variables on big leaf maple. So throughout time, so we looked at that prison data set and saying like, oh, if it was, what was the temperature like in the summer or the winter in 1991? And what was the ring widths of the trees to try and see like what effect different climate variables had on the growth of the trees and using that as a proxy for health. Um, second goal was to reconstruct the spatial temper patterns of big leaf maple decline. So right now we see that the entire state of um, or entire range of big leaf maple in Washington has similar rates of decline, but to see if that was always the case, whether they all kind of happened at the same time or whether it spread um, throughout the range, whether it arose in the north before the south, something like that. And then we also wanted to compare big leaf maple to nearby coniferous trees uh, to determine if the decline is species specific to see if like growth rates in these declining trees have just gone down in the big leaf maple and they're doing just fine in the other conifers or whether it's 
uh, something that's maybe affecting the whole forest. So you would expect if there was heat stress or droughts that it would be affecting all the trees, even if it's infecting, affecting some more than others. Uh, so this is where it's associated, the association between decline and precipitation. So the gist of these is basically that, uh, sorry, this is uh, associating growth with uh, precipitation and temperature. So there's higher growth when it's a little bit cooler in the uh, summertime, maybe a little bit warmer in the wintertime. Um, that's probably likely because there's more sunshine in those warmer winters. Um, and then also for the precipitation, the more more precipitation there is in the summertime, especially June and July here. Um, you can see that that led to greater growth. So kind of um, matches up with our other findings um, that heat and drought in the summertime are negatively affecting these trees. Uh, so this is the spatial temporal analysis that where we tried to use growth as a um, as a proxy for determining when decline happened. So this is kind of just a graph to explain. Um, so the growth of the, the ring widths naturally go down as the tree gets bigger, just because you know the, the rings are larger, they go around a bigger tree. So the same amount of wood that they put on is gonna be stretched thinner and thinner, but it should fit this nice trend line where it uh, starts high and then kind of goes down and slowly levels out. But if we detrend that, so if we say like, well, where's that nice line? And then subtracting that, we can get this graph down at the bottom where it's fitting a good curve, fitting a good curve, and then all, all of a sudden, suddenly, uh, the tree drops below that and it's growing less than it should. So that's how we determined our uh, year of decline. So as soon as it drops down below and doesn't go back and hit that detrended line anymore, that's the, the first year we're saying, okay, this tree's starting to show uh, some sort of decline. Uh, so this is the year of decline where you can see the oldest sites are the clear triangles, the 2006, 2010 um, solid triangles, and then the black uh, circles are the, the most recent decline. So what this is kind of showing again is that there's not really any pattern throughout the state that it's kind of happening everywhere all at once. And there wasn't a really clear, uh, uh, again, pattern of any sort of like direction that it's moving or spread or anything of that nature. So that kind of points more towards a regional effect like for, like climate or weather patterns and less towards a invasive biological pest that might you know be shown to spread throughout the state. Uh, this is kind of just the graph to, to prove that. So again, on really short distances, there was some uh, spatial correlation. So this just says that if you find a declining tree, you're likely to find one within like a you know a kilometer or two of it. Uh, but as soon as you get out to about 25 kilometers, there's really no, no interaction there. And this makes sense, you know, if there's a valley that's gotten kind of hot or there's new development in there, it makes sense that if one tree's decline and the other ones are as well. But what we're really looking for is these longer distance uh, correlations that would show that it's moving on a regional scale. Uh, so this is work that was done by another graduate student in the lab. Uh, after I graduated. So he was looking at powdery mildew in big leaf maple. Um, so they've recently discovered a new species of powdery mildew. Uh, it's native to Europe, but it was first identified in Canada in 1938. Um, and, but it was only recently within the last, uh, during this study, so the last couple of years that it was found on big leaf maple. Uh, only prevalence on big leaf maple was only recently found. So this again is, kind of part of this whole grab bag of issues that we think are affecting the trees. So it could be changes in beta biology, increased abiotic suitability, climate change, or relaxation of biotic resistance. So something is changing recently that's affecting uh, the conditions or the tree's health or something that's allowing this uh, pathogen that previously had not affected big leaf maple to move into the big leaf maple uh, population and affect the trees negatively. So again, kind of points towards some sort of large regional, probably abiotic um, issue that's affecting these trees. Uh, and this is something that's been noticed kind of prevalently in the Seattle area. Um, 
And the first presentation you heard went over this in much greater detail, but this is kind of just a little, little aside. So this happened after I graduated and I finished this study, but in 2021, there was a heat wave in the Pacific Northwest nest, which I'm sure you are all aware of. And uh, kind of just wanted to point home that the issues that we found that are affecting big leaf maple um, definitely are continuing to happen and will probably happen in greater severity and extent. So this isn't something that these trees are likely to recover from. It's something that's gonna keep hammering these, uh, these trees. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah. Um, we have a question. Sure. Um, Emil would like to know, are additional deciduous species in the range of BLM exhibiting similar pathological decline? Pathological or decline, I should say. Uh, yeah, I'm aware um, Arbutus, I'm trying to... Uh, so like Pacific Madrone, I know that's experienced in a... <laughs> pretty similar decline in the like British Columbia and Washington and Oregon as well. So I know there's a lot of different tree species in the area that are also uh, experiencing increased mortality, um, some to the level where they're, you know, calling it a, a decline in the tree and they're concerned that there might be big population losses. So I think, yeah, this isn't something that's necessarily um, restricted to big leaf maple. I think it's something that's part of a a wider trend among tree species, um, both deciduous trees, but also conifers as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, and and stop your sh screen share, and we can invite the other two panelists to come back and see if you have questions for each other. So thank you. Everybody enjoyed all three of the talks. So it was wonderful. <laughs> so thank you. Stop sharing. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Connie and, and Chris, do you have any questions for each other along with Jacob? Uh, uh, Connie, you're, oh, there you go. Chris, we don't see you or hear you. So, here I am. <laughs> here you are. You've been found. <laughs> any questions that you have amongst yourselves or things you'd like to share? Well, I guess all I would say is, Jacob, I've been watching that big leaf maple decline for years, and I was hoping you could give us the answer today, but <laughs> I, I know it's been kind of a mystery for a long time. Yeah, we so we didn't prove anything conclusively, but I think we definitely kind of leaned it more away from some sort of invasive pathogen or pest, and it's most likely climate change, possibly with some increased development going on in there as well. So. Similar story to most other problems we've been having in tree species. It looked like most of it was close to development or roads. Did you find any um, in the forest, like away from roads and development? Uh, very little. And I think that kind of ties back in um, with the point that Chris made earlier that when you're showing that graph of all the different trees and how resistant they might be to uh, stressors in the future. And you pointed out that big leaf maple is one of the least um, susceptible. And part of that was that it, um, uh, a lot of them are in riparian areas. And we did find that riparian areas and that like the close coastal kind of plains right on the west side of the Olympic Peninsula, those trees did look pretty healthy. But there are a lot of big leaf maple that are um, like lining roadways. And you notice that like if you're driving on a highway, a lot of times there's just rows of big leaf maple that kind of naturally sprung up on either side, uh, mm -hmm. probably you know using a little bit of that runoff from the road. Those are the ones that really seem to be stressed out, as well as the ones in urban areas and people's yards and parks. So some of the um, uh, more remote um, populations of big leaf maple are probably going to be a little bit more resistant and do a little bit better, but there's still a significant number of trees and urban areas and along roadways and things like that that do seem to be struggling quite a bit more. Right. You know, Jacob, in climate change effects on trees, they're, they're not outright lethal, but they and ability to sublethal stressors that it's encountering. For instance, 
Chris, you're freezing, so you might want to close your screen and just. I can try turning off the video and see if that okay, helps. Video, yeah. And um, is is it possible that uh, that there may be an undisclosed pathogen still at work? For instance, uh, Phytophthoras are something that minor genetic variants have been introduced to the United States and had locally significant adverse effects on trees. So it looked like the review of pathogens kind of hit the usual suspects, but wasn't uh, wasn't yet comprehensive. Yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely possible, like you really, you know, it's kind of impossible to like absolutely 100% rule out any pathogen. Uh, they did look for phytophthoras and they weren't really able to find anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then that the main thing that made us kind of look away from pathogens, suspect that it was something else, was again that spatial data where it said if it was phytophthora, it might be showing up in uh, particular areas, but really it seemed like throughout the entire range that we studied, um, it was kind of happening everywhere all at once. Um, you know, we would suspect like some sort of watershed or maybe, you know, specifically in urban areas or something like that for a pathogen, but, um, or I guess like, uh, like particular urban areas, like, oh, it's really bad down by Tacoma and then up in Seattle, but it's, uh, you know, fine down by Vancouver, but we didn't find that. So kind of consistent with maybe a genetic vulnerability? Yeah, or just uh, in certain, could be genetic. Um, I mean, obviously like the trees growing down in Southern California, even though the same species as the ones grown up in British Columbia, they're not uh, locally adapted to the same uh, areas at all. So climate change might be like, um, you know, hammering particular trees hard, like the, you know, the trees that grow in Washington might be doing fine with the current climatic conditions down in California, but they aren't those same trees. Um, and also, yeah, potentially these trees are just growing in areas that are a little bit on the edge. You know, if you're next to a road or in someone's yard, you do fine on nice, you know, cool, wet years. But if you get too many summers in a row that are just a little bit too hot and a little bit too dry, you can really wear down on those trees and, then they get some sort of pathogen or some sort of pest that really knocks them down, or they're just suffering from plain old drought stress. Bill Brookerson wrote in the chat that his brother has a lot of land, um, not a lot of land, but a lot of land <laughs> in Castle Rock. <laughs> he has seen a significant uh, difference in the big leaf maple closer to I-5 than on upper headquarters road. So, and, you know, water runoff is not quite the same and um, and the pollution from the roads. It's hard, it would be hard to discriminate or to reduce or determine which of the factors are more predominant, I would think, in that situation. But um, anything else? It, it seems odd that it might be pollution considering that big leaf maple have been exposed to severe pollution in areas like the Seattle area for decades. I was, yet, I was wonder, wondering if the decline they, is recent. If they are putting any chemicals on the roads when in clement weather. I know back east they did that and they had a huge decline in trees along roads. But I don't know if they do that here. So we looked into it a little bit and I, I agree on both counts that like it seemed really kind of far-fetched to us because if anything, pollution has actually gotten a lot better in the Pacific Northwest with like, uh, you know, cleaner standards and things like that. So all of this heavy metal deposition and stuff should have been way worse in the 70s and 80s than it is now. Um, when we, we looked, but we couldn't find any sort of new source of pollution. And that goes for uh, roadway additions too. It doesn't really seem to be that they're okay. um, salting the roads more or anything like that. And we also didn't really find any like, super evident evidence of uh, uh, roadway additions too. Like, you know, you, you kind of get the like, the spray where it's like the stripe on the tree leaves that, you know, something came up off the road and really knocked them out. It really wasn't that, it was more just like pockets of trees that just, you know, look like they're having some sort of drought stress response. So we didn't think it was pollution, but it was just something we wanted to look into. Thank you. For Connie that uh, concerned 
the uh, is it being evaluated for things like uh, resistance to high temperatures or drought stress as well as so Chris I I'm not hearing everything you're saying but I think what you were asking was are are the seedlings that are being developed at uh, at Darina being evaluated for anything besides white pine blister rust resistance? Um, yes. Did I get that? Okay. Yeah. And and I guess the short answer would be no. The the real um, the focus right now is white pine blister rust resistance. Okay. And that that seems to be the most um, most impactful threat at this point, but climate change is, is just gotta be right up there. All righty, well, folks, it's way past 2.30 and um, I wanna thank you all for your invaluable time. This was wonderful. We got lots of thank yous and comments and it was a marvelous presentations and everything was so important. So the audience was really happy and uh, I'm so thrilled you could all be here with us today. So thank you very, very much. Your presentations were terrific. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for putting it together and all your work on NPAM, Gail. Well, thank you. Yeah. And it's my pleasure and thank you, Denise. All right, Good night. goodbye everyone. Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Thanks, Chris and Jacob. So long. Thank you.